and we are ready to go. Okay, well, welcome to the April 27th, uh, 2021 session of Tangerine SDR and HAMSI Technical Session. My name is Dave, KV0S, and this week um, I've been working on, I'm still dealing with the book a little bit, and uh, which is my past job, and um, have been dealing a little bit with the um, whisper transmitters that Tapper works with, and I haven't actually gotten much programming on my uh, simulator, although it, I did uh, <clears throat> get all the libraries I need for both CRC32s and SHA-256s in multiple languages. So we're getting close. Uh, that's it for me. Next on the list is Nathaniel W2NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I've been continuing to uh, work with uh, students and uh, collaborators on the different projects. Uh, things are coming along, doing a bunch of data analysis. Um, let's see, I ordered a Max 10 development board, which came in, and I have promptly given it away to my student, Kung. So hopefully, he seemed very excited to get it today, so hopefully this summer he'll uh, be able to make some good use of it for the project. Very good. Back to net. Next on the list, we have Bill, AB4EJ. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, hey, thanks, Dave. Good evening to you and good evening to the net. Um, been busy this week. Uh, my students got the uh, first pass of the central control system API running on the server we're going to actually run it on. And I uh, just today got the local host to where it can send a heartbeat to the central control system using production code. And uh, today all it gets back is an acknowledgement, either yay, yay or nay, that it was a good, it was a good uh, get. Um, but uh, we will uh, add the capability for the central control system to send things like commands of various kinds, like data requests and things like that, to the local host. So we've got the uh, we've got the first first step of that working. Uh, also, I got working uh, on the central control system the first um, implementation of using Mapbox, uh, which is uh, something similar to the way Satnogs displays. Uh, when you go to Satnog's homepage, they display all of the uh, implemented satellite monitoring systems that they have in place. Well, what we'll do is we will show the location of all of the tangerines that are uh, at least in a semi-connected, either fully connected or semi-connected state. If they've been offline for a while, we'll probably drop them after a certain amount of time. But anyway... So we've got the ability to do the, uh, the, the just, it's just a blank map right now, but I've got to add some code in there where it goes into the database and um, uh, did, is able to extract the lat longs of all of the uh, uh, online stations and then show them as icons on the map. So back to net. Very good, Bill. And next on the list, we have Dan in for XWB. Go ahead, Dan. Dan, are you there? Well, we'll come back to Dan. Next on the list would be Bill in eight ET. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I don't have too much. I've been pretty busy working on the uh, R2 Pro board. Got my last board to do on that. I have to wind toroids, and I'm discovering it's Pretty difficult winding the toys with one hand and left handed. So, oh. <laughs> so I get through that tomorrow. But <laughs> other than that, well, I haven't done anything at all on this project. So we'll be back next week. Well, uh, welcome back. And we'll, we'll be happy to have you next week, too. So next on the list, it uh, looks like Dan uh, didn't come back. Uh, we got David McGaw. N1 HAC. Go ahead, David. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, 
not too much to report. Continue to work on uh, the on rockets and ground-based receivers, and uh, looking forward to being able to input on uh, VLF board. See how the clock board's going. All that. Look forward to the discussion at the end. Back to net. Fine business. And next on the list, we have Dev KC3 PVE. Does your mic work? Dev, are you there? Yes, does it work? Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes. So I'm connected to a phone, and, and throughout the day, I'm having trouble with my laptop. Uh, Zoom audio. I'm not sure what's going on. Otherwise, we, have a, we are having a good start of the week. Uh, and uh, we're working on projects uh, with the students. And I'm teaching, I think, my final uh, chapter for, for a course that I'm helping uh, Nathaniel with. Thank you. OK, very good. Uh, next on the list, we have Gary, uh, AF8A. Go ahead. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've been working a little bit this week with uh, Jim K4BSE on the Gen 1 grape documentation. I think we've got uh, one more wrinkle to solve on the, uh, on the introductory document. Uh, and then Jim can think about how we want to post that. And then we'll start working on a uh, hints and hacks for anyone who wants to consider building a Gen 1 grape. So that's it. Back to that. Very good. And next on the list, we have Homan Kim. Uh, KD2MCR, go ahead. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've been pretty busy with some uh, other matters, so um, nothing really to update uh, today. So I'll just looking forward to uh, listening to what other people will be talking about. So back to that. Well, fine business. And next on the list, we have James, uh, KG4DSG, go ahead, James. Good evening, all. Uh, missed a couple of weeks for other prior commitments, couldn't get out of, but I'm back and listening and eager to hear what's happened since I've been gone. So with that, back to the net. Very good. And next on the list is Jay. Uh, I don't remember your call sign, Jay. Sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, Whiskey Bravo 8 Sierra Bravo India. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I got the... Uh, Scotty, uh, fr from Scotty, I got uh, these two boards. Uh, thank you very much, Scotty. And uh, uh, now I just got to figure out how to hook them up and use them. But this next couple of weeks uh, is going to be rather difficult for me. Uh, um, I'm in uh, a week from today, I have to have some surgery. So I'm in sort of uh, uh, that that's occupying my time getting ready for that so, and so i'm going to be uh uh confined to quarters and uh uh it it's going to happen next monday and it, it's going to take me out of circulation for a week or so so uh uh i'm going to be laying low uh you know recovering from that uh but it'll give me a good chance a good excuse just to play ft8 all the time um Otherwise, uh, I'm just trying to get keep my arms around these things. One thing with this great project that has happened to me is uh, because of the fact several years ago, uh, we had a flood here in the Detroit area and uh, I had to clean out my totally clean out my basement because the basement needed to be rebuilt. The man cave had to be totally rebuilt. And rebuilt and one of the things I didn't do is I didn't rebuild my test bench uh, since then so now I've got to go through and rebuild my test bench and get surface mount tools and a magnifier and uh, appropriate soldering iron so that's one thing uh, I I'm maybe reaching out to the group for help of uh, now having not worked with surface mount ever I'm good at soldering a PL259 I can do that, no problem. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, surface mount, I got to go through the learning curve on this. So, uh, if anyone could comment here tonight, uh, what kind of soldering 
uh, tool. Is it a hot air soldering tool or is it actual an iron uh, that I should be getting to solder surface mount here? Uh, so that that's uh, my question for tonight. So back to Ned from WB8SBI. Well, very good. And I'll throw in my one, two cents. Uh, get yourself uh, a binocular microscope if you don't have one. They're not that expensive, but they sure help seeing those little pins. Uh, next on the list, we have Jim K4BSE. Jim, are you there? I see him there, but I don't see any voice or, well, maybe we'll get back to Jim. I see Dan, so why don't we grab Dan while he's there. Uh, Dan, in for XWE. Uh, thanks, Dave, and good evening, everyone. Yeah, I had a little issue with my uh, PC. It started right, I, I don't know what happened, but it started running uh, uh, Zoom as a zombie application. So oh. no matter what I did, I couldn't uh, reboot it. And then it took me about six or seven minutes to let the thing reboot. Anyway, um, don't have much to add to the conversation except that um, Ubuntu Mate 21.04 was released last week. Uh, the Raspberry Pi version has not been released yet it generally lags about three or four weeks behind the main release. Um, interestingly, Ubuntu uh, Mate is now used or it will be with 21.04, we'll be using uh, Python 3.9 as the default okay. installation, which I think is helpful, helpful for Bill. I think it is. I'll let him comment on that. but. Uh, I think it should be a, a good thing for us. Anyway, that's it from here. Thank you. Fine Dave. business. And let's see. I think the next on the list is Jonathan, KC3EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, I don't have much to report. Um, I, I'm uh, working pretty deeply in my uh, latex uh, book project. Um, it was also a bit of an emotional day for me because I, um, this was the day that I uh, went to pick up my uh, graduation gown. Um, that's uh, coming up in a, uh, you know, um, about a month or so. And uh, yes, thank good. you. And um, uh, I, I was interested in the uh, doing a, a little bit of discussion on the VLF receiver. If the, um, if, if those um, differential transmitters and receivers are not obsoleted, even though that they are hard to find right now, why don't we just stick with them and we'll just stock them when they get stocked. I mean, if, if it's going to be stocked in November or, you know, sometime this fall, maybe this summer. Um, other than that, that's all I have. Back to the net. Well, fine business. And um, Jim, did your mic work? Jim Farmer? No signal. Uh, also on the list, uh, Dave Witten, KD0EAG, jumped in. Go ahead, Dave. Hello. I think I was having some of the same um, problems that Dan was having. I went to open up the Zoom session nice and early, about 10 till, and it went zombie on me. And I had to, uh, I tried shutting everything down. Finally, I had to shut the whole machine down. And then that went to doing some, you know, uh, who knows what it was doing, but it, it takes a long time to reboot. So I went to my other machine 
And uh, at the other end of the house and the mice, all the batteries and all the mice were dead. And so I had to come back and get some batteries. And then this machine was up, round and round it goes. So Zoom, I, here I am for what it's worth. Um, otherwise, not a lot to report. I've uh, just been doing uh, interactive, fooling with magnetometers in Python, mostly from Raspberry Pi Picos and some other little widgets, um, that sort of thing. Nothing of compelling interest to this group, I don't think. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, next on the list, we have uh, Jules, K2, KG. Isn't there a J in there? Yeah. Oh, I got it. I missed true. it. <laughs> All right, Dave. Well, to the uh, net. Nothing new to report this week. A little late this evening. I was tied up in the middle of an experiment. Uh, no problems with Zoom, but uh, just got in late. Um, the magnetometers keep recording well. I haven't had a chance to do some graphical anal analysis recently. Apparently, we had a uh, uh, a flare that, uh, that passed by the uh, rather mass ejection that passed by the Earth and created a bit of a geomagnetic uh, disturbance. Maybe uh, Hillman has something to report on that. Uh, I haven't had a chance to graph my uh, latest results, so which which I'll do in the next day or two. Back to net. Jules, uh, what day was the flare? Uh, that was on the, I believe it was the 24th, just before midnight UTC. Um, it wasn't a flare, actually, as I say, it was a CME that passed by the Earth. Okay. And, uh, but it, it did raise storm level to a G4, I believe. Okay. Thank you. I'll check my log for that. Right. Um, next on the list, we have John KJ six IBP. Go ahead, John. Um, speaking of, of flares, uh, will this equipment uh, let us know if there's currently a uh, CME hitting the Earth? I guess that's a would be eventually a question for Bill, if he's planning to put any uh, flare detecting. Well, my, my experience has been uh, if you well, just in watching the output from the grape over the course of the past couple of weeks, uh, I did see a dramatic change in what was being displayed on the waterfall, on the grape, and we don't have that kind of thing running for the tangerine yet but um with a little bit of a little bit of coaching you should be able to look at it and tell now i mean currently there is no plan to put some sort of artificial intelligence kind of system in there to detect when that's actually happening but um there are ways to look at the signal and say hey i see something that based in the past has been a flare so i mean I mean, that's, that's potentially possible to do, but that's not necessarily part of phase one. I have something to add. I was looking at the NOAA website and they've made some additional, they have a radio web page, uh, electrical engineer uh, circuit uh, web page, and they have one for space enthusiasts. And the one for space enthusiasts has quite a bit of information that's useful to this group and it does report flares there, so. What page was that? The, uh, the NOAA uh, space weather site. If you get space weather, there's a commercial site that has lots of nice pictures and a little bit of telemetry, but the NOAA site has much more and they have pages that are customized to the things you're interested in and ours are either radio or the space enthusiasts. Okay, I had to restart my computer. I think I got my problems set now, thanks. Okay, did you wanna make any comments? Well, let's see, uh, Gary mentioned uh, some of what uh, we were doing, working up the um, uh, help pages, getting that started. I'm uh, trying to get the um, get a uh, form up there that people can fill out and send that will let them put their question in. I'm having a little trouble with it, but I will get in touch with uh, um, uh, 
someone if I need to. I did finish my uh, uh, grape one, uh, at least the uh, mixer board, and uh, it seems to work okay. I've been trying to try it out on WWV, but uh, since Thursday when I got it working, propagation has been so lousy on two, uh, five and 10 megahertz, I haven't been able to do anything. This far away, two and a half is useless. But five and 10 usually come in pretty good, but not now. That's about it. Okay. Well, thank you. And glad you got your, your uh, Zoom working. Next on the list, we have Michael, AAK. Go ahead, Michael. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, greetings to everyone listening. We just had an unexpected or unforecast uh, thunderstorm. So. I may disappear yet. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Fine business. Uh, next on the list, let's let's jump down and grab Veronica, uh, KD2UHN. Go ahead, Veronica. Hello, everyone. Uh, so lately, I have been working on, I just submitted a paper to IEEE for a paper contest they're having in my area. Um, I got the results back. I came in, in fourth, which very good, <laughs> very close to third, but not quite. <laughs> um, and then I'm just I'm working on turning that paper into a rough draft for Dr. Purcell's space physics class. Um, and then in space physics class, Dev just taught us a very uh, nice lesson today about auroras. Um, and then uh, more so pertaining to the grape, I have been working with um, so Claire from Dartmouth has sent us a little bit of her code and I've been working uh, to kind of apply that cross correlation method with the data that I have from my grape and then the folks at Case Western and JIT, their grapes as well. And then aside from that, tomorrow our radio club is gonna help out Dr. Purcell with uh, setting up some antennas and I'm very excited for that. And then also um, not so much with ham radio, but it might be of interest. I registered for the uh, NASA Rock On workshop, and I just got the box of all the components for that. So hopefully soon I'll start assembling that. But, oh, yeah. Very Thank good. You. Back to you. Yes, sounds wonderful. So next on the list we have Scotty W A two D F I. Go ahead, Scotty. Hey, Dave. Very good. Thank you. Um, this week's been uh, kind of busy uh, getting the final parts uh, orders in. Uh, we have, uh, we did manage to find some of the um, uh, Ethernet parts. Unfortunately, we need 25 of them. We ended up having to buy about 200 of them because uh, it's a minimum order. But hey, that's okay. Nobody else has them. They're not going to be out until October. So I figure I could take the extra ones and sell them on the gray market. And probably make our money back that we what we paid for the, for the two hundred of them. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe uh, look for them on eBay, right? Anyway, and also continuing on on the uh, pin swapping for the uh, data engine, our CAD guy is doing an amazing job. We we did the pin swapping for the USB two port, and I think he got all of the wire, all the connections between the FPGA and the USB connect USB uh, controller, all on one layer because we organize the wires so there's no crossovers because on the FPGA we can do that. So uh, we're continuing on with that. And uh, once we get that done, then I'm gonna wanna get with uh, you, Tom, and we're gonna go over the connections to the RF module and make sure everything is uh, connected up properly so they'll work when we plug them in. Clock module essentially done, waiting for uh, some cleanup and to make sure that we don't have to change anything based upon what happens on the data engine. So it's like a, jigsaw puzzle with all uh, inter and not necessarily interlocking parts but they're all interdependent so and they can each side can be moved so you want to pick the most optimum for both sides so i think that's about it so back over to you dave well fine business and i think the next on the list is tom in five eg go ahead tom Oh, good evening, Dave. Good evening to everyone in the group. Uh, let's see. This week, I got the test set up for measuring the third order intermod performance of the receiver set up and running. I managed to borrow an HB8560B signal generator 
and built a resistive combiner and, and was able to take data that looks reasonable on the Hermes. The nice thing about the Hermes is there's a wideband mode, so you can see the raw ADC samples, and that makes finding um, the clipping level in full scale on the ADD converter very easy to do. You just run it in wideband mode, twiddle the attenuators until it uh, comes down off the rails. And uh, I have some unusual artifacts in the third order IMD. I think the generators are talking to each other through the power combiner. But other than that, I'm getting reasonable third order intermod numbers on Hermes. And so I think we have a good test set up now to measure the dynamic range of the tangerine. So uh, back to the net. Well, fine business. And I think that's the end of our list. So we should go for open discussion. Have I missed anybody? Hearing none, we're open. Uh, this is AB4EJ. I had a question for Tom McDermott. Um, dealing with the, the, the question has to do with the size of a waterfall display in GNU radio. Um, is there any reasonable way other than going down and modifying the Python deep down inside of, of the block uh, to, to control the size of the waterfall display. Um, like right now, it, it looks like it shows about six hours worth of the waterfall. And I was thinking there would be a certain advantages if I could enlarge it to show 24 hours, but do you know any way to uh, to customize that? Well, the um, in terms of the display extent, there are a couple of parameters uh, in the uh, tab, uh, column and column count and row and row count. So you can uh, set up the number of columns and number of rows. Those are selectable through the GUI for the uh, waterfall you'll find a couple of parameters. Um, it's a very cryptic field. It says like display and it's got, you know, uh, comma separated numbers in the display to select row, row count, column, column count. But that just controls the extent of the waterfall on the display itself. How many, how many rows it can occupy, how many columns it can occupy and where it sits with respect to the other GUI elements. I fear trying to get 24 hours of pixels may be difficult <laughs> because I think you run into a problem. You'd probably need to display about 10,000 pixels in height to get them all on there. And so I'm, I'm not sure there's an easy way to do that. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the property of QT GUI waterfall sync. Okay. And I don't see anything about columns and rows here. Okay, let me let me fire up a VM and go take a look and, and find where it is. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you where on the menu it is. Hang on. Uh, okay, it may be in, it may not be in the QT side. But anyway, yeah, I, I'd be more interested to learn something about that. Yeah, yeah I, I know. It's definitely in QT, but I forget huh, where it is. Okay. Yeah, it would definitely require a tremendous amount of memory. But um, nowadays, with the Raspberry Pi going up to to eight gigabytes in, in RAM, maybe we can do it. We'll see, but let me know what you figure out. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, the difficulty is that if you're trying to express 24 hours and each uh, pixel is you know um, 10 seconds, then you have 8,000 something pixels vertically uh, per, per column to represent 24 hours. And how do you display 8,000 pixels? Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Okay, anyway, back to Net, and, and Tom can break in when he has something else to report on that. For Jay, um, and you're uh, building your, your station, 
I use, uh, I'm going to have to turn off my background video here. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to see this. So one second. OK, I use these, a pair of optivizers. And you can put yeah. a, a magnifier on one eye. <clears throat> And you can put an <coughs> LED light on the uh, on the headband, and um, don't get the cheap ones. Get the seventy or eighty dollar ones that are glass lenses. Okay. If you yeah. get the, if you get plastic lenses, you you'll sooner or later you'll melt one with your soldering iron. <laughs> <laughs> also, don't don't bother. If you think, oh, I need lots of magnification, don't get the ten X model, because the focal length is so short that you won't be able to really use it. You're going to have to get so close to your soldering iron, you're going to burn your nose. So it's, I think I use um, a two and a half X or three X for the main lens part here. And then another two and a half for this. So when you put them together, you know, you get uh, almost 10 X. I was thinking of getting, I saw it on Amazon. Uh, um, um, it's a microscope stand that has a, a display panel on it so that I didn't have to wear a headpiece. Yep. Those are awesome, except my only problem with fixed, mic fixed microscopes, whether it be an optical one or a digital one, digital ones are good because you can move the work around and get it so that you can see it and then stop touching it and it stays. The problem is with the, with the I can't ever get the optical ones to stay, stay put to, to keep the, the work in the right place or I move the microscope or uh, like especially the ones that have the circular light in them with the magnifier in the middle, they never stop moving. It's like, uh, you know, the, the, your exhaling moves, makes a thing move. And then the focal length changes. And, and so something attached to your head is really good because it's fixed to, between your eye and the lens because it's around your head. So yeah. there's never any, um, I mean, you just move your head forward or back to focus. What I was also going to get, there's a, a, a scan uh, of, of it. Uh, it's got four from, you know, the, the four corners. It's got clips uh, on the four corners. So you can put the work mounted on the stand and put that stand yeah. underneath the scope. Therefore, uh, the, the stand is holding the circuit board and I'm got both my hands free. And it has adjustable height, right? So you can adjust the focus on uh, either the stand or the microscope. Uh, I would assume so, yes. Yeah. Uh, or I can move the, the work up and down. I can I can move the right. vice any way I other want. Thing, other thing on the microscope, uh, the, I, the microscope that I've got here has a uh, fluorescent light fixture around the lens opening that yeah. sl slips on. So it gives you lots of light <clears throat> and actually one of the things that I did find useful is if you could find them at flea markets usually, or you can find them on eBay, is their um, octopus lights. So they have a power supply that's big and heavy, and then they have, it's a halogen, usually a halogen light, which you may be able to fix using LEDs these days. But these are usually pretty inexpensive and they give out a ton of, of aimed light. And I got one with two goosenecks on it, so you could put them down on either side of the work and you can just flood the work with light, which really helps for us guys with old eyes uh, to get more light on the work because uh, yeah. it increases the depth of field. So, um, yeah, this is going to take some effort on my part. Now, the boards that you sent me, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, um, the what looks like the magnetometer board has that got three sensors on it because it looks like an X, Y, and Z. That's correct. Axis. That's right. It's a okay. three axis magnetometer. Yeah. It looks like what we did in automotive where you got roll pitch and yaw. Yep. Okay. Now, other than a power supply and some cabling, are these boards ready to go? I mean, I just. You, you should be able to plug the board without the magnetometer module onto a Raspberry Pi 3. Yeah. And you should be able to connect the other board with the Cat5 cable. And you should be able to run uh, Dave's software and talk to the board. Okay. And however you mount it, like uh, the way uh, the way uh, Dave is doing it or uh, the way Jules is doing it, uh, any of those ways are good. 
Yeah. So, uh, uh, all right. Yeah, as mentioned, this is going to be uh, at least a couple weeks uh, delay here while I uh, uh, recover from surgery. I actually uh, use an Odroid N2, but you could use a Pi 3 or a Pi 4. And I've okay. used a uh, Nano. Well, I want to use something that's got enough memory on it, you know, enough capability to, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do I want to say it? Future proof it, if possible. Well, I will tell you, I've been collecting data since June, and I haven't filled up uh, a drive yet. And the beauty of it is, as far as future proof, when your Raspberry Pi runs out of room, throw it in the trash. It's only 35 bucks. Buy another one. Buy something bigger. By the time that happens, the thirty-five dollars will, will buy you something bigger. So <laughs> now, does that uh, board? Okay, so it's it's out there. It's collecting data. Does it upload it to my local hard drive here on my machine, or wh where where's that data go? It currently, yeah. it currently stores on the whatever computer board you attached to it. And I'm using rsync to upload it to a site that Dave Witten has so that we're experimenting with the Linode site. So uh, everything that I'm collecting, I put up on Dave's site. We haven't made it uh, official for everybody to link to it yet, but uh, we're testing it. And the, really the, the biggest issue is just getting the passwords set yeah. up. Okay, that, that's, that's a, a start. Uh, so uh, the other thing, Scotty, is uh, uh, when, when soldering uh, uh, surface mount components, do I want an iron or a, uh, a hot air gun? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. I, d I don't have any hot air uh, other than uh, uh, speaking to you guys here. And uh, aside from that, <laughs> yeah. I do, I, find... have a, I, I do have a, a, a heat gun, and uh, you can build yourself out of an old Coke can and a pair of scissors, a shield that will shield everything on the board except the part you want to unsolder, and that works pretty well with a heat gun without frying everything. Right. It's more about focused uh, hot air devices actually quite helpful in um, working with surface mount. And you can get uh, Pace or Weller or other um, solder stations that have um, uh, a nice fine tipped soldering iron and hot air and a solder sucking tool, all of which are useful. Have you seen those ones on, on eBay for uh, under 200 bucks? Is that the ones you're talking about, Dave? I'm talking about the expensive ones, you know, Pace oh. and the name brand. But yeah, I... I'd be interested if anyone's gotten one of the cheap ones and whether it uh, actually works. There's a number of YouTube reviews on them <laughs> that are pretty truthful. And you, you get what you pay for. Yeah, because the ones, the, the, the name brand ones are like in the $1,500 range. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I looked on the Weller website, you know, $1,000, $1,500, and it was like, no, not going to happen. Yeah, but again, yeah, there are the, the cheap Chinese ones that probably are perfectly good if you can find uh, reviews of the actual the, item. The, the I, one I, I've used is a WSD-51. Have you used that one, Dave? That's that's pretty Yes, cheap. yes. It's under, under $200. In fact, it's closer to $100 than it is to $200. Mm -hmm. And the TC-2000 is the next step up, but it's about $250 on DigiKey. Nice, very nice irons, but and, and the other thing I would recommend, and I, I bought all my irons at flea markets, and you could find I found a, uh, a, a TC 2002, one of the LCD models, and all that. Ten dollars the guy wanted for it. It was like <laughs> okay. I don't think he knew what it was. It was in an estate, and he just said, "Oh, you know, ten bucks, and you can have it." That's but, what you call a hot iron. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so, so I would also recommend getting yourself maybe one that like uh, I use a WTCP, which is 
temperature control, but it's controlled by the tip that you put in it. And it's really interesting. It's got a reed switch in the in the heater, and they use a magnet in the uh, the, the tip comes with a magnet in it that loses its magnetism at a certain temperature, which then opens the switch and turns off the iron. And then when it cools down a little, it closes the switch. So you yeah. you buy a, a six, seven, or eight hundred degree tip to put in it. So it's pretty crude, but what I use it for is to unsolder the components because if you put an iron on either side of a two pin component, you can take it off real easily. Right if now, you, I just want to get it on there. Yeah. So well, all you well, need is- Well, those are, I use those all the time and it's very effective. It uses, uh, to, to be technical, it has a controlled Curie temperature yeah. in the tip that uh, controls, you know, when it's above a certain temperature, it goes non-magnetic. The the power switches off. But, to it. but the point is that that's it's a fixed temperature. It's, yeah, it's uh, yeah, so the tip gets to... controlled. You know, the tips are a controlled temperature. You buy which ones temperatures my, you want. My, I always use the higher temperature ones. I like high advice, temperature, yeah, quick yes, work. Yes, for unsoldering, I turn it all the way up. Yeah. For soldering, you want to be a little more careful, especially like if you're soldering germanium transistors or something. But my advice for SMT is if you can't poke yourself with the tip and draw blood, it's not small enough. <laughs> that's that's yeah. just rule of thumb. But there are, there are some very fine tips you can get for that particular iron. And then the other trick is if you get a very fine tip, don't get a long one. You might think, oh, well, that length is really nice to stay away from other components. But the problem is it sucks the heat away from the tip and you can't supply enough heat with conduction through a half inch long tip to unsolder like for instance, uh, a component that has a ground that's connected to ground without a thermal. Yeah, for, yeah. for the Weller for the Weller TCP series, you want a PTP eight or a PTP seven. Right now, right. Papa seven. Tango Papa is the finest yeah. point they make. And, okay. and the thing about the WES, you could buy tips for it. And, and I have it, it's got, it's a fifty watt iron, but it's temperature controlled, so that, that you're not going to burn anything up with the fifty watts, except if you put a stubby tip on it. You can actually solder copper clad boards together to make cases out of it. It's, it's okay. Kind of, if you use a very short tip, that's fat. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some of the model numbers? Uh, you, uh, Scotty, you said WSD Whiskey Sierra Delta 51. Right. Who makes that? Weller. It's a Weller. Okay. It's kind of like their hobbyist version. Okay. What, what was the. Remember, uh, Weller one? swallowed Unger and maybe some other things too. So there's some mixed numbers in there. Let's okay, see. fine. And there was another one you said, TC, Tango Charlie? WTCP, I think it's, is there a T at the end? You remember WTCP is the one I remember. Yeah, there's there a the couple of models of it. The WTCP element. is the basic one. Right, yeah. that's got the Curie element in it that uh, you buy the six, seven or eight. And like, like Jules said, seven or eight is the, the tip that you want. And the tip, by the way, when you take the tip out and you look at the base, the number's stamped right on the base, six, okay. seven, or eight. How, how many that watts? WTCPT. Yeah, and that, that's what I, probably a 30 or 40 watt iron, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. The yeah, watt is what it is, but and, yeah, and it, it's sufficient. Mine is a 60 watt, but they're, 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 rough, they're roughly 50 watts. And as you say, Scott, if you put the heavy tip on it, you can solder darn near anything with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I use the mid-size conical um, for most work. And then there is the long, thin tip, which I use for uh, surface mount when you don't need a lot of heat, but you need a very fine tip. OK, so uh, unfortunately, DigiKey doesn't have any in stock, so I can't give you a price. But I can give you the link to it so you can go from there. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through the learning curve on all, everything surface mount. That's that's the WTCPT iron. I got, okay, I see the chat. I'm copying it now. And let's see. Uh... Yeah, there's there's uh, nothing worse than a crummy soldering iron to ruin your uh, uh, experience with SMT. 
Yeah, they, they don't just, have any in stock. Yeah, so go to go to Mauser and see if you can find the same that same stock part number. Okay. And Hako, H-A-K-K-O, that's a good brand. Uh, what was the other one you mentioned, Dave, that was uh, other than Weller? I think you said there was a name of one that you had mentioned. Dave, your phone, microphone. You can usually find happen? the Wellers at uh, flea markets. Yeah. Uh, another company is Pace, P-A-C-E. Okay. And if you want to save a ton of, ton of money, go to Alibaba and there's, there's any number of knockoffs. One of the things that the more expensive irons give you is they give you quicker heating of the tip. Well, you might argue that, well, you don't really care how long it takes to heat the tip because, you know, you got, I mean, if you're retired, you can wait the next 10 seconds each time you turn it on. But the trick is the quicker the tip heats up, that means the lower the resistant thermal resistance is between the thing you're soldering and the heating element, which means that you, for a given wattage, you can solder and desolder heavier, you know, direct grounded copper things and and not probably not PL 259s with a 50 watt iron, but still, I mean, you could use as far as I'm concerned, you could use a hundred watt iron on SMT if it's temperature controlled because it's mm -hmm. going to keep the temperature where it's going right. to keep the temperature, so it doesn't matter. That just gives you the limit as to how much iron you can heat up with your iron, so to speak. I don't know the model number, but there is a um, continuously controlled version of the WTCPT. <clears throat> a little okay, more money, with, with but the you pot. can dial it in. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Daniel, can I, can I uh, share a screen image here? Uh, yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Um, Bill, the, um, the, what you're looking for, here's the waterfall sink down here on the screen. Yeah. If you double click it, you'll, and scroll down the window, you'll see this field bar GUI hint. And that's on all of the GUIs. They all have a GUI hint. Okay. If over, and if you go over to the documentation tab here, um, it tells you how to, it's, it's a string of comma separated numbers that tell you how to position the widget within the display. So you have a, um, you can put it on a tab if you want, um, or the tab is optional if you don't have a tab to display. And then you can put the row, the column, the row span and the column span so you can make the GUIs of different size on the, on the display element. So if you click the documentation tab on the, on the item, you'll, you'll get the help for the item. That's very helpful, Tom, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nathaniel. This is uh, what I use for removing surface mount. <laughs> yeah, my dad had one of those. You could use it for uh, soldering copper pipe and- um, Yeah. American, American <laughs> Beauty, right? A thousand watts? It's, About 1500 yeah. watts. It, uh, the one he had was, it was, it was powerful enough that you could melt, melt down a fishing sinker. Whoa. Oh. Uh, yeah, I've got I've one of those that my father used to build heath kits with. <laughs> well, heath kits. No, my Doom this was used kits. for plumbing, the one that don't my dad had. No, this was the probably would have worked too. Well, maybe not quite that big, but it was uh, like a half inch tip. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, and that's what you use to put uh, tube equipment together. Yeah, my dad had one like that. I learned to solder with that. And they do a nice oh, job yeah, with PL two fifty nines too. <laughs> yeah, that's well, true. I still have my uh, hundred, hundred, my my dual heat hundred, hundred and forty watt soldering gun from when I was a novice back oh, in yeah. nineteen seventy four, and it works just fine. Oh yeah, it, Weller, of course. The Weller Melter. 
Actually, I have a super welter melter too that's twice the heat power, twice the wattage. You have a, a 375 watt gun? Something like one? that. I forget. It's in the 200 watt range instead of the 100, 100 watt range. Yeah, they make a 100, 140, and they make a 200, 275, I think, and then they make the 375, which is. Yeah, the... yeah I, I think I have the 200, 275. Yeah, the I've, got the three, I've got the 375. The 100, 140 that I have, but that was the very first piece of power equipment I ever bought as a kid. Uh huh. Well, it's interesting because I had my my dad had one of the 375s, and uh, he he'd had it forever, and it was just beat to crap. It with the case was cracked. The the, you know, the two prongs out the front were kind of loose, and it had the two lamps on the front <clears> because <throat> it was the big heavy duty one. You're not going to believe this, but I actually found a new case on eBay, brand new NOS, and I put the new put it on the iron, and now I have my dad's old iron all brand new, fixed up, and I can use it again. But yeah, what are you going to use it for? PL two fifty nine, probably. What, yeah, what applications do like you that. have? The PL two fifty nine is the best one, and it, it can solder antennas with it. Solder antenna wire. Yeah, the other thing you can use them. No, I, I the definitely use my well cases. The other thing you can use them for is you take the tip out, then get yourself some number twelve wire, enameled wire or bare wire. Make a a coil about four inches in diameter, and stuff the ends into the soldering iron uh, sleeves. Tighten up the uh, the nuts, and you've got a wonderful degaussing tool. That's what you true. do is you, you hit you hit the switch. Wow. You hold the switch. You bring your tool in slowly. Pull it out slowly. Make sure it's uh, about a foot or two away when you let the uh, switch go. And yeah, it's degaussed. There you go. How long can you hold the key down? Actually, quite Why a while. Quite a while. Yeah. I've got one of the original. Well, um, I've got one for degaussing color TV sets. We used to use them at, uh, at the physics lab for degaussing photomultiplier tubes. Right. This question is for all the OFs on the list here. How many of you made your first electromagnet with number 18 copper wire and a nail and a one and a half volt dry cell the size of, uh, you know, that big? Yep. Yep. I yep. used number you 24. Up, you hook it up and, and, the, and the coil heats up so that you can barely hold on to it. It's got to do great things for your dry cell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. The first experiments you can do with almost no stuff. You can make a motor out of nails and wire. Yeah. That's Have you right. seen the one where they, where they actually take a Duracell battery and some paper clips and they make a motor out of it? Mm -hmm. and, and some echo, they, make, they, take, they have clips like these, echo clips, only smaller ones. And they use they put the battery in between here and they support it on the the paper clip and I it's amazing it can't last for very long because it doesn't have much of a coil for the motor but it actually spins around. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Modern day nail, what's that, Mike? Degausser. Oh, <laughs> tape degausser. Mm -hmm. I, I have a bulk tape eraser too for a quarter inch tape. It's about yeah, that was a broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh yes the 60 cycle transmitter i never did make a spark coil transmitter so i never got in trouble with my neighbors anyway i'm looking at irons here on on um on mauser eha well it looks like a weller is now apex tool group right i mentioned that oh you did i, I missed that yep okay. but uh and of course weller absorbed unger and some others so there seems to be conglomeration going on yeah but i'm looking here and i put the things in in, in um cost order <laughs> and it goes from 275 to 478 to 557 then it goes up towards a thousand bucks for the all these fancy stations so maybe the best thing to do is look on ebay or uh places like that 
since I don't know about you guys, we aren't having any ham fests here because of the COVID thing still. But if that ever comes back, it's a mm-hmm. great place to buy uh, used stuff like that. Yeah, swaps in the Detroit area are QRT. Yeah. yeah. We're starting to back up here. We've yeah, got we the Tuscaloosa a ham ago. fest. We had a couple of weeks ago, one in Tucson. I would say if you're lucky, 2% of the people were in masks. Everyone else was not. Of course, it's outdoors, which helps. Well, uh, I mean, where we we are, the only people who go to ham fests are, you know, 65 and up, and they've mostly been vaccinated. So, but yeah, we're going to have the Tuscaloosa uh, ham fest here. I think it's the weekend before field day. So they- Is that a big fest? Want me to, it's- no, it's not big, but if the, anyway, I'll get a chance to give a presentation about the tangerine. Oh, what what are the chances that I could have a prototype by then? By field day? Third week of June. Yeah. Uh, uh, Near zero or? You'll have some. a prototype of some of the boards maybe, <laughs> but a full set is going to be difficult. It'll be close though. So we should put you first on the list. It would be great. I mean, yeah, I mean. Would it help if you had like an RF board or a clock module to show? Even if you didn't have a whole set? Well, I mean, I would hope to be able to do a demo. I mean, so, I mean, I need the need the tangerine for that. Well, I don't know. Having hardware in your hand and having a demo, those two items are spaced apart in time, I think. Yeah, right. I know. I know. So. So you yeah. we might be able to get you something to hold up and say, here it is. We're just starting to debug it. So. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Now I can also I can also do the same thing at the Huntsville Ham Fest, but that's a little bit further down the road. That's I think the third weekend of August. Okay. So better have something by then because they're going to run me out of town on the rail if I don't have it by DCC, <laughs> which is the hey, third uh, week. Scotty. Scotty. Yeah. Uh, is it okay if I need some assistance that I could contact you directly? Sure, just send me an email. Uh, could you put your email in the chat to me, please? Sure, it's wa2dfi at is one of them, which okay. works. Well, I'll put the other one in. I, can I just noticed a listing that said that the WCPT, whatever it is, um, is no longer available and replaced by a uh, digital unit. Yeah. Um, well, they used it's, to only, have... it's only a little over a hundred bucks. So I found what's, it at a test the... equipment depot. What's the model number of the replacement? WE1010. Okay. Uh, and what's the uh, website where that is, the, the 1010? Uh, I found it at Test Equipment Depot. Technic Tool is another one that sells these. Yeah. Just don't waste your time with something that isn't temperature controlled because right. you'll want to, want to do that. Of course, I did a lot of work with the old old Unger, um, 33 watt, 45 watt. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, I still have a couple of those sitting around. You want them? <laughs> I don't, I don't. It's kind of like- I keep in my kit. It's kind of like my first motorcycle was a Honda 90, but I'm not gonna go out and buy one because it just really kind of sucked. But it was, it was awesome for what, to the money that I had at the time, at the age I was, but. Well, I like the younger irons because I can screw the um, element off and uh, fold it up and stick it in a toolkit. So I've yeah. built a lot of billards with those things. Production and hobby. I'm looking on eBay for uh, soldering iron, soldering stations and not really much that I would ever buy. <laughs> Looks like tons of cheap Chinese stuff that, you know, it's, I mean, 
the people here built stuff. They, I mean, anybody who's worked on cars, you don't want to buy cheap tools. You want to buy good tools. So, yeah. So, so yeah, DigiKey does have this new model in stock. So that seems to be what's replaced it. Is it WE101? WE1010. WE1010, okay. And DigiKey has it for under 29. Uh, this other place had it for a little different. That's Whiskey Echo 1010? Correct. Yeah, EDU, right? No, here's an NA. There's an EDU. I don't know what the difference is. It's uh, about 40 bucks more. Oh. Looks yeah, like it's NA the same exact. Be the standard one. Oh, it's it's a kit. It comes with solder and pliers and, you know, a bunch oh. of other stuff. Okay. Yeah, and it has the, okay, it has yeah. the same types of tips. But you're not really going to find anything, I think, as as pointy as some of the more expensive stations, are you? Because that looks like a WTCP size tip. Right. Which is well, not I put in the, uh, the chat the fine tips that I use. They are long and thin, but they work well for surface mount. I do down to um, 050 spacing uh, with okay. those. It is kind of hard when the tip's wider uh, than the spacing between your pins. Or is it, yeah. Well, of course, a lot of the technique with surface mount is um, for the really fine stuff, you just make a big solder bridge and then you wick it off. Yeah. Some things, though, you have trouble doing it that way. Correct. Well, you have to tune it to how the yeah. board's been put in. So, I know I had an FPGA I was doing one time that was a 050 pitch and mm -hmm. did the flood technique where you just run down the side and you mm -hmm. suck a bunch of solder on it. And I had two pins that for the life of me, I could not get the solder bridge out from behind. I just, uh, just would not come out. I tried sucking on it. I tried solder wicking it. I tried flooding it again and wicking it again. I don't even remember how, how I fixed it because one of the one of the ways you could do it is you can heat it up and you can bang it on the table and you can try yep. to dislodge it that way, but that can I've get cut them out with trouble. an exacto knife. Those yep. PCA yeah, 95 and 90. 96 15s. Yeah. Those PCA 96 15s will do that to you. Now, here's another technique that if you have a, a PC board that is um, uh, pre tinned has solder on the uh, on the pads. You often with a good, if you have a clean um, component, um, not oxidized, um, you can actually just heat the pin and it will solder. Flow the solder from yeah. the PC board onto the pin and it works very well. Like you said, if you have flux, external flux, that works pretty well. Yeah, that, oh, that's right, that's another key thing for working with solder mount is you have to have uh, liquid flux. A little bottle with a like a syringe type uh, needle. Right. It's, not, a, needle. it's not, not sharp, but it's yep. a tube that you can apply drops of flux to. You do need to get more than one uh, syringe. The, the flux eventually eats the rubber of the uh, syringe plunger. <laughs> I just use a squeeze bottle. Yeah. And eventually it gets all gunked up and you pitch it and get a new one. Right. But I'm looking for even soldering tips. Come on, they got to have a, a category. Look under uh, EAE oh, and sales in, in Indianapolis or Indiana. EAE sales. He's got everything soldering. Mm. We're down to one electronic store in the Northeast, in New England. You do it. And I heard that Fry's has gone under. Fry's has gone in Phoenix. Both stores. Well, I think all together. Yeah, um, yeah they, they closed them all. Yeah, I've they been to the one in, um, I think, uh, San Jose or whatever. One of the big ones, but it's sad that it's gone. 
Yeah. I would recommend for a surface mount, uh, which I use quite a bit, um, actually not this station, but it's the FX 951 from Hackle. Uh, right. Huh? Yeah, I know that name. It's uh, kind of taking over. Yeah, it, um, I've been using Pace for years. Uh, where I work, we use Pace. Um, but I've noticed that the usability and quality of Hapco seems to um, overrun Pace. So what I would recommend as a starter for the surface mount soldering is the FX91 uh, station. It's a single channel station uh, with the handle and the T15-I tip. So it'll probably run you a little under $300, but it's a very good quality tool and you're gonna have it for years. Uh, and I would definitely recommend that for surface mount or at least starting off. That is the thing with the most of the name brands you're, you're muted. Could, could, you, could you put that uh, information into the chat, please? He did. One of the things about the name brands is, too, that every part's replaceable. So you'll have it forever. Okay, the last chat I saw was uh, uh, Heiko USA. The, uh, okay, yeah. That's what Jonathan's saying. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind blood? of the new kids on the block, but they're doing well. Can you draw blood with the tip, Jonathan? Yes, actually, that tip is extremely sharp. Um, they have other tips, too, but that's my favorite tip that I use for chip components and yeah. their small pitches. Oh, and I, I'll give you another tip, Jay. Um, get some uh, a tin of flux that you can dip your iron in. That'll help retin the, the iron. And keep yeah, keep, uh, uh, keep uh, solder idling on the tip. I, I came in the other night. I left my iron on overnight, and I forgot about it. And that just ruins tips faster than you can. This stuff. Leave it. Yeah, tip that's tinner. Our, that's tip tinner. That's it. That's worth its weight in gold. And you know, Contact I, East. That's the name I remember. I think they got swallowed. Who did? Are they still around? I helped out at the ARL kit forum back at Ham Benchin when they had the ARL kit forum, when they still had it. And um, the biggest problem that all the people had at the kit forum was that the irons were not tinned. And what they would do, they were teaching them how to do this, and they would make the solder joint, and then they would wipe the iron and put it in the holder. So the iron always idled with no solder on it. And after about two hours of doing that, you couldn't even solder with it anymore because mm -hmm. the solder wouldn't even stick to the tip. So I told him, look, get some of this tip tinner like Dave showed you. And the trick is put a lot of idling hard uh, solder on the tip and put it in the holder. Let it idle with solder on it. Right. When you're ready to make a joint, then you wipe it off, get a nice clean tip, and then you make the joint, and then add some extra solder and put it back in the holder. Well, after we started doing that, it took about 15 or 20 minutes of doing that before the irons became really usable again. And the one woman I was helping her, her ham, her, her husband had been a ham for 50 years and she decided finally she was going to build a kit. And so I think she built uh, electronic keyer of all things. And um, she was having just a devil of a time because she couldn't, she put the iron on the joint and add solder and it wouldn't melt. It just wouldn't melt. Even if you touched the solder to the iron itself, it wouldn't melt because it was all oxidized. And by the time she got about halfway through the kit, it was just easy in making joints because you put the iron on there and touch the solder to the pin, not to the iron, and it would melt. So it would actually transfer heat. And the trick was leaving the idling solder on it. So whatever yeah. that's worth. I'm now, this is, tells me how old this uh, tinner is. And so it doesn't go very fast. Um, doesn't go bad either. Got it from uh, Contact East, which is now Jensen Tools. Wow, Jensen Tools is still in business. Yeah. Wow. And they they swallowed Contact East and a bunch of other guys. 
when we started our business in 1995, we bought a toolkit from Jensen Tools. Mm-hmm. That was our that was the basis of our starting of our the toolkit at the company. I I actually purchased a lot of paste tips from uh, Jensen Tools when I got an MBT 250 for for my home bench. Um, a lot of the tips for the uh, pencil and the uh, solder extractor came from Jensen Tools. Yeah. Well, they had a local out office here, and I could just walk in and buy a toolkit. So that's what we did. Daniel, you look like you're ready to go QRT. I think I am. I was just trying to figure out a good time to say that. So I think I might <laughs> say 73 for tonight. It's not snowing there, is it? <laughs> no, I've got to take a new picture of my uh, backyard here. I'll have to uh, change it around. It was pretty cold last week, though. We, we did get some snow last week, so hopefully it'll start warming up now. But we're supposed we're, to get rain today. Yeah. But, Ooh. But I think they lied to us. We're going below freezing tonight. Oh. Yeah, we yeah, had a couple sure. below freezing last week, and I'm uh, very afraid that a lot of our uh, props may have gotten uh, wiped out for this season. Next Saturday is supposed to be 103 here. And that you means... have it. No more, no more single-digit temperatures much after that for highs. Right. Once it starts with over 100, uh, you, know, you don't get any respite until October. I'm and heading you know, out also, guys. Oh, I think it's going to wrap it up good for Good night, tonight. everyone. Catch you the next time. Good Very good. We'll see you next time. 73. Good night, everybody. Good, 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 good night, everybody. I'm going to check out also. Good luck Take with, care. Good luck with your soldering equipment. Thank you. Thanks for your advice, guys. Take care. Good luck, sir. Good luck Good with night. all that. 7 3 doll. 73. Now, what was, Jonathan, what were you saying about uh, differential uh, receivers, transmitters being hard to get? Yeah, the, the, um, the uh, uh, two parts that, that you found that were um, um, out of stock. Oh, uh, the, uh, yeah, your uh, LVDS. Yeah. Um, if they're not obsoleted, I was going to say, well, let's stick with those in, in, the, in, the, in the design those, anyway. Yeah, those won't be obsoleted. But they're used all over the place. There okay. are two different series the TI both carries. Um, I can't remember how you, if I gave you both numbers, but because TI merged, uh, took in uh, National Semiconductor. Yeah. National has different numbers than TI, but they all work the same. So there's a 90 um, version, and then I think that's Nationals. And then there's the whatever TI has. But, oh. But yeah, they're the, don't be afraid to design with those parts. Um, the pinout is universal. Oh well, then okay. Yeah, then uh, we'll, we'll just stick with that um, yeah. because I don't really know the exact schedule for this VLF board yet. Right. Uh, yeah, and has anyone gotten the uh, A to D converters? Found them anywhere? I checked a couple of sources in uh, in China. They were gone. The last that I checked, I, I checked a couple of weeks ago. There was not any stock. Um, I believe TI had stock if you wanted to order from TI directly. Uh, no, last I checked, they didn't have any. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe they're not the uh, 6140. Yeah. And my suggestion was that if the 6120, if they have prototyping quantities, it's a preliminary part. So they're, they might be willing to let us have a couple of the 6120s to um, at least work with. But do you have one of the eval boards for the 6140? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, so you have at least one part, even yes. if we don't have can't put it on another board at least you can work through the um, programming of it 
Yeah, and 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 a uh, a carrier board could be made for the um, uh, for the the uh, um, evaluation module part of it. There, are, right. There are are two parts. There's the USB controller, and then there's the actual eval module that TI swaps out for its, its different different parts. So we could take that and just make a carrier board and that could be right what we use for programming. Um, well, yeah, we're I, all gonna have to work around stuff here because well it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. Yeah that that's normal but uh, I'm sure uh, I haven't seen this kind of a hiccup in a while. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the fabs, um, but there's a pretty crazy short. There's there's a lot of shortages. So, well, part of it is just um, scheduling because of the epidemic, and uh, my understanding is that you know industries like the automotive industry stopped ordering parts so the fabs shut down and now they want the parts and the fabs aren't up to speed yet yeah yeah so and 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 it, and, it, and it takes quite a bit to and god knows how many parts were stuck on that ship in the or uh, stuck <laughs> with the suez canal business <laughs> they may all um resolve once they get around to africa <laughs> well yeah we'll just work with what we have yeah. uh and i'd say probably reasonable stay the course and yeah go ahead and lay things you know we can lay things out and you know the parts will become available eventually and the other models in that family of the A to D converter, I believe that's really true. They're is... pin compatible, as I, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. the 6140 is the highest performance. But if we could get any of the, like the, the five or the three version, um, they would work too, at least yeah. to get started. Yeah, I, I think that they use use a lot of the uh, same register values, too. Yeah, I did look th for stock on those, too, and they're all... I haven't been able to find it either, but... I wonder what they're used for, because because I haven't seen, seen a lot of applications for those or equipment that uses those, I'm, I, so I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, well, there are automotive uses. There's um, high-end stereo. Well, even low-end stereo or quad uses. Um, there's actually quite a market of um, semi-pro audio. Oh, that's true. Well, yeah, I was, I was kind of looking at like, like pro audio USB interfaces. Right. And, um, it, most of them don't really say what what A to D and D to A converters that they use. Um, so it, it's 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 kind of hard to tell, and you have to hope that someone takes one apart and takes pictures of the board, and then you could find out. That's how I found out with the Behringer, um, but um, that uses a serious part yes yeah um yeah it's too bad serious didn't work out but their filters are crap <laughs> yeah well see uh for the low frequency stuff for the natural radio a, a lot of people are using them in the vlf groups that i'm part of and they have right. very good success but um, a lot of them don't really use them in the higher frequencies. Upper right. Band. Yeah, at lower sample rates, they're fine, but they've um, cheaped out on the filters at the higher sample rates. It kind of defeats yeah. the purpose of the higher sample rates. 
Yeah, I, I was hoping that I could find some sort of um, some sort of pro audio device with this ADB converter, so I could I could. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to look around. See, well, I used to design those. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what I wanted to do, see, the the uh, drawback with this evaluation board is that you can't use it as a USB sound card. Uh, yeah, that's first, interesting. It doesn't have that functionality. Well, see, it does, except you have to initialize the registers in the Windows evaluation uh, software. Ah. Once you initialize them, then it turns into a regular USB sound card. Oh, I see. But you can't just plug it in and have it run, you're saying. Right. Oh, that's interesting. And I would thought they'd have a, a program on the board to set those. Well, I think the way that they wanted to write the software, the evaluation software, I'm, 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 I'm not really sure what their thinking was, but um, they they probably wanted to make the board as user friendly as possible to be able to, to change and configure everything about every register. So right. that's why that I think that they did it that way. And I, I asked TI or at least on their message board and they didn't have any information on, um, on how to how to program the USB interface uh, with the appropriate register configuration. Oh, uh, interesting. So, so it was, it, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate if you want to evaluate this on something other than Windows. And I wanted to evaluate it on uh, Linux. And right. it doesn't work look like I could do that. So I was on the search for, for some sort of pro audio interface that uses this, but I didn't find any yet. Well, it's a pretty new part. Maybe that's part of what's going oh, on. Mauser says August 23rd. Oh, that's new. That's better than what we've 500 seen. 500 expected 823. Oh, cool. So I suspect the if we put an order in, we'd be getting the queue. That would be probably reasonable. Yeah. How many do you think we would build? Initially, probably no more than 10. Yeah, let's see. What do they want for? 10 bucks a piece. Yeah, that's not bad. You know what? I could probably sneak that order in to the HPS or to the uh, tangerine stuff that we're doing now. Okay. And uh, you, want is, the, uh, you want the sixty-one forty? You don't care what package, right? Well, there's Are only there choices. One. Apparently, there's two packages. I'm not sure. Maybe that's just temperature ranges. I, they, there were two part numbers. Um, oh, they're well, different. There are two part sizes. numbers, but it has to do with uh, how they're reeled. The real sizes, yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Only one part. Only one package type, then. Right. Yeah. Either one is fine. Yeah. Let me. I'm at the web page now. Yeah, if you go in and say under availability, it says 1500 on order. If you click view dates. It's yeah, it's just, the only difference is how big the tape, uh, yeah. the reel is. One is a 3000 and one is a 250 part reel. Right. And we're buying uh, cut tape anyway, so it doesn't right. matter. It doesn't matter. No. So I could, let's see what I can do. We got, there's a half a dozen parts that we have to deal with on the tangerine anyway. That, uh, we have to figure out how we're going to get. Well, yeah, if, if, if there's some money left over and Nathaniel's okay with it and, you know, I would say order them. 
at least we have them. And there's then, never any there's never any money left over, Jonathan. But there's there's surreptitious, uh, uh, you know, sneaky stuff that we do because we have to because we know we're not going to be able to get them. Oh, okay. But you know, when it says eight twenty three doesn't really tell you when the next order after that is going to be so it might be right you know because the most of the places i'm looking at claim 35 week lead time wow more than six months that's like right. december yeah we were singing november yeah but mauser says 20 weeks so let's see is that is uh august 23rd 20 weeks that sounds it's about four months, May, June, July. Yeah, but it is. Yeah. About 20 right. weeks. Oh, well. Yeah, but the going price is about $10 in quantity 10. Yeah. So that's reasonable. And you really don't Thanks. shave off that much for going to 25. I think okay. for single unit quantities, uh, I think it was like uh, $12, a little over $12. 11, 11 24. 11 24 is what I'm saying. 10 33 for 10 and 9 96 for 25 and 8 72 for 100. Right. Which we're not going to buy yet. <laughs> not at this time. That's not bad. You think in a run of 10? Okay, so what interesting. I think that's doable. I mean, yeah, I definitely no no more than 10. Because um what I would like to do is I would like to uh send these to people who live in areas that are conducive for VLF. So places where Nathaniel lives and areas where uh, you could find some low hum levels. Um, it's uh, not really easy to find such an area. Yeah. Uh, most people live in the suburbs and, um, and with, with, with this chip, your upper end is what, 200 kilohertz? 200 uh, more is higher than that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, the, it's um, you know, the 192 kilohertz sampling. Well, we're hoping for 100 kilohertz. But this, at, this chip like, goes up to 768k sampling. Right, it does. Filters don't. That's what's really nice about it is, it really has a very high. But but the filters don't go up that high for cutoff frequency, do they? I thought they still cut off at like 350 or 500, something lower than 768. Um. Yeah, I can't remember, but uh, what attracted me to it is that the at the you know order of two hundred kilohertz sampling, it has a very a good filter, whereas the serious part we were looking at has a very relaxed filter that was not adequate for what we want. Alias is a lot, so this one's got some. Uh, some filtering on it but yeah it's interesting that uh, you can sample up to 768k we could uh, encroach on the broadcast band that's right <laughs> yeah it, it, that's it, it, it's it's a really great part for uh this sort of thing I'm, apparently I'm like, it's a great part for someone else too because they bought them all up yeah, yeah. somebody's using them I'm I'm uh, really interested to see the performance uh, on the lower end um, for the natural radio stuff, but um, yeah, this, this seems like a good choice. By lower end, what are you talking? I'm talking below thirty kilohertz, down to like um, um, thirty hertz. Yeah, well, they'll do that just fine. That's that's the audio band. Yeah, that's what they're made for. You got to have them very good in the twenty to twenty kilohertz, and then for 
people like me you have to go above that but 20 to 20 kilohertz is considered you, you normal hearing the one over f noise when you get down well, that's probably way down low like below 100 hertz well right? it depends you got to watch that in your uh, analog amplifiers because uh, depending upon the type of amplifier you use, you can start getting one over F at 10 kilohertz and below. Um, but the ones that we use for high high end audio have a one over F corner down around 10 hertz. And that would be like these, right? Be the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, we're going to try to resolve our uh, parts availability issues tomorrow. So. Uh, Sneak if I can sneak these in. Okay. Yeah, we'll be good to it is, it see is if they'll uh, let us put them on order. It's on the same project, so because we have some other ones that aren't coming in until the first week in June. So uh -huh. we're getting uh, primed for assembly. That that's on the data engine. So we'll do the other boards first, and then mm -hmm. we'll. But that's why I was telling Bill, I you know it's. If, we're, if we don't get the part till like the 6th of June, the third week in June is probably, I mean, he, he may get a board, but he's not going to get anything tested out because we're going to just have had it put together by that time, depending on the scheduling, I guess, with our CM. But the data engine is not for the faint of heart. There's uh, 567 parts of the data engine. How many? Sides, 567 parts. Uh-huh. Guys, it's funny because we save some money by having our guy, our CM hand assemble and then reflow solder the boards. So the clock module has like 170 components and the uh, RF is even less. And so he was being real facetious because I kept asking him, well, how much leader do you want on the parts? Because if he has to feed him into the machine to pick and place, he's got to have leader on the part. So that means we got to buy extra of the, the cheap parts like resistors and caps to get the leader. And he kind of got tired of me asking him how much leader he wanted. So he says, look, we're going to hand place all these boards unless you got more than 300 components on it. So I wrote him back and I said, well, the next one coming has got 575. I think that's more than 300. So what do you want to do? <laughs> so he's still going to hand place it because it's, it's split almost evenly between the front and the back. And so there's less than 300 on each side, if you will. It's just that one side has all the BGAs and all the fancy stuff on it. And the other side is all just resistors and caps. But he's going to hand assemble it, so that's okay. It's expensive, but it's not as expensive as paying for a machine setup for 25 boards. Right. So we do it that way. And then we go to production. Then we'll pay for a machine setup, but we'll amortize it over 500 boards. Yeah, we actually, at Dartmouth, we have uh, one of the carousel machines that we use to populate our boards. We have the students hand assemble them. Well, you, they, it's a pick and place machine, right? Well, it, uh, it basically gives you the part in a bin and tells you where the part is supposed to go. And you place it. Oh, okay. Not automated then. Not automated. Yeah, because this pick and place machine that this guy has, here, our CM has, it has multiple placement arms, and so they have to program right. the parts on such yep. that they oh, don't. Oh, I know how those over. work too. But yeah, but yeah. it actually is quite effective. And I've done it's, contract. It's much you faster know, because you sent out to contract work to houses that use the the carousel and the laser pointer and the the person who places the component yeah so it actually points at the location for it gives you the bin that's holding the part and you put the part in yeah and that's actually pretty good it's fairly effective yeah especially because the machine's handling the part right you're just right you've got optical uh, view and, and a robot arm and you control it right no no robot arm you're pl placing it by hand but it's telling you this is the part and this is where you put it okay so um low error rate yeah all right sounds good i can take off here hey dan i'll call you tomorrow okay great
get things mm -hmm. going. All right, perfect. Are you, did, did you get your stuff done? Is your preliminary stuff done? I haven't got anything done. So we got to get uh, rolling here. Yeah, really. There's times the ticket. Henry has a call to find out if the project's finished yet. I know. <laughs> Are we there yet? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, talk to you later. 7-3. Later, everyone. Good night, guys. 7-3. Good night.